found me. You're listening to the Inkwell. Hey, I'm Faye Woolwich. And I'm Atticus Andronicus. And you're listening to the Inkwell, a podcast where we look at the parts of life that get your goat and goad your gut. So, you got some news for me, Faye? <laughs> Not really breaking news. It's actually kind of old news. <laughs> oh, old news. Exciting. I love old news. Yeah, well, look. I'd been online reading up about the postponed 2020 Olympics, which really sucks. But, you know, it's what we have to do. I was thinking about how growing up, my whole family would get together to watch the Olympics, like an extra family holiday every four years. Like a kind of second Hanukkah, but quadrennial. Exactly. And this year, not like we've done it since I was 17, but this year it's definitely not happening. So I was thinking about that. And then I was on Twitter, and, you know, we've all been on Twitter too much recently. I know. I think I might have sprained my left thumb. And there was this viral thread about the 1904 Olympics marathon, which took place in St. Louis, Missouri. And Atticus, this marathon was like nothing I'd ever read about. How can that be possible? You live in New York City. That's a marathon of its own. People in costumes, little dogs in carts next to their owners, old ladies running the whole thing. Listen, this marathon was really, really weird. First of all, it's in St. Louis with 90 degree heat on a seven hilled track. Not a nice run by the river. And there are only two places to get water because the guy in charge wanted to test the limits of forced dehydration. God, that sounds horrible. So as far as contestants go, you got your career runners, right? They're prepared, if not excellent. Right, okay. And then the racers take a turn. This one guy, Fred Lors, can only train at night because he works all day as a bricklayer. Then you have 10 Greeks who have never run a marathon. I guess they were there because, you know, the marathon is Greek? Right, of course. The Battle of Marathon to Athens, 490 BCE. Then there's a Cuban mailman who loses all of his money on a dice game on a ship's casino. He has to hitchhike to St. Louis. He must have had a bad poker face. Mind you, that's all before the race. During the race, an amateur collapses and starts to have a hemorrhage in his lungs. Someone else is chased off track by wild dogs. Another guy eats rotten apples and takes a nap on the side of the road. Then, okay, Lors, the bricklayer, right? He's nine miles in, hasn't even gotten to the first water station. He just witnessed a stranger almost bleed to death. So, what does he do? He hitches a ride in one of the cars riding next to the track. Holy moly. Now that's what I call a hit and run. An American runner, Hicks, has trainers who won't give him water but decide to feed him egg whites and rat poison. Right, I forgot to mention. Before steroids, they used rat poison as a stimulant. Rat poison. Lance Armstrong, you listening to this? Lors hops out of his car and runs across the finish line. Hicks, twitching and hallucinating, is carried into second place. This is the craziest marathon I've ever heard of. Uh, yeah. So, I learned all this, but I needed to know more. Classic Faye. I learned one more fact about the marathon. A fact that seemed not so heinous, given the wacky nature of the whole event. But as I learned more and more, it got weirder and weirder. The one person who actually should have won, who was the favorite, who was supposed to take home the gold, never showed up. 
Can you tell us who it is? Oh, I can tell you. But first, let's go to a little town in Scandinavia. Picture this. Snow falls on the small Scandinavian town of Krug. Someone runs past you in the blink of an eye. That blur that just zoomed by, his name is Hans Kvalheim. Wait, that name sounds familiar. Probably because he's part of the legendary Kvalheim family, four medal-winning Olympian brothers whose mother is a milkmaid turned momager, and their uncle popularized magic shows in Scandinavia. It's 1880. All there is to do is climb mountains, swim in the fjord, hunt dinner, and run around. And that's exactly what Hans, Christian, Andersen, and Klaus did. Hans and Christian, the two eldest, are basically Usain Bolts, well, if he ran marathons and was a pair of Scandinavian twins. Though the kids were known to fight, they were also inseparable, at least until the day of the 1904 Olympic marathon. Anderson, the second youngest, was the most skilled hunter in the town of Krug and the champion archer at the University of Schwalderson. Then, never the last in a race, and certainly not the least, is the baby of the family, Klaus. A gold medal swimmer, he once swam the full perimeter of the Krug Fjord, a whopping 127 miles. So, basically, these guys are like superhuman, tall, handsome Scandinavian gods. You know, whoever made this magical DNA, can I have some? (laughs) Or at least meet a man with some? (laughs) So now it's 1903, and the Kvalheims just got a call that they're going to compete in the 1904 Olympics. We found this in the Mother Helene's diary. My boys and I are so happy. I knew this day would come. They work so hard, and now we get to go to America. I must tell the butcher. Before the boys leave, the town has a huge party for them. Ice sculptures, clogs, dancing, even a bronze statue of the four brothers. When they get to the U.S., it's said they still have confetti in their hair. Well, either that or really big pieces of dandruff. I guess they didn't have head and shoulders back in 1904. Once the boys arrive in old St. Louis... They're shepherded to the Olympic Village. And you know what that means, Atticus. Do I? The Olympic Village is a notorious hotbed of boinking athletes. You know, the Olympics aren't all work and no play. When the brothers first arrive, they're immediately whisked off to a 15-course dinner sponsored by the Krugian Consulate. Long story short, in the morning, after a night of drinking and probably more than one sexcapade, Hans is nowhere to be found. Hi, I'm Brian, with an I, a fact checker for The Inkwell. If not evidenced by this podcast's comprehensive stock of information, (laughs) I lost a lot of sleep while producing this episode. And I assume a lot of our listeners at home are under similar stress as well. Times are hard, and rest is more important than ever, Luckily, our generous sponsor, Hypnos, has a solution. Hypnos offers its unique handcrafted organic mattresses made from a combination of pre-loved rice fibers, unbrushed brown cotton, and semi-sustainable twine webbing. Coming in six standard sizes and a nuanced variety of firmnesses, Hypnos guarantees a gentle night's sleep. Also, you can get an ambient prescription Yes, uh, without consulting a doctor. Hypnos will prescribe Ambien to help you fully achieve a peaceful night's rest. If you don't want Ambien, we also have Lunesta and its generic equivalents as well. Also, don't need a prescription for those either. That doesn't... Um... Okay, uh, where was I? 
Delivery is free if you order on the website with the code Olympics. But download Tor and use that instead of Safari or Chrome. Go on the server called MaddieBoy321 and tell the moderator, quote, Fear not the mighty storm, unquote. Then enter the password, which is SLIMQUICK in all caps, no spaces. The rest is intuitive. Uh, Faye, is this the right thing? Which one? Hypnos? Yeah. That's right. This is like... I think this is illegal. Just read it. We can edit it if need it's be. It's definitely not the right one. Enter the password, which is some quick dinner. The rest is intuitive. No, yeah. This is right. Just read it. Okay. <clears throat> Hypnos is available in all 50 states except Wyoming. If you live in Wyoming, Hypnos will deliver the mattress and or your pills to the Colorado border and then you can drive the stuff back to your house. We operate by word of mouth, so please do not promote our services on social media. Hypnos, for a gentle night's sleep. Wow, I did not see that coming. Anderson, maybe, but Hans? The beginning of the games is defined by this one question. Where did Hans go? The Olympic Village is a buzz, but no one files a missing persons report. Go figure, the Krugian Consulate's budget goes to its 15 course dinners, not its investigative bureau. In 1904, people assume Hans will turn up hungover and dazed from a romp with some hammer-swinging hunk from Montreal. The ceremonies begin, the games go on, and when they end, everyone ships off to their home countries. Except for Hans. Hans never shows up. So people weren't really looking for him? As I said, there was no missing persons report. So the only people looking for him are his family. Here's Helene, the momager, in a radio interview. We looked everywhere. Our house, my house next to our house, the bar, the barn, the koi pond. Nothing. His family gives up. They go on living their lives. Hansless. He disappears without a trace. Poof. Like magic. My heart is pumping. What comes next? At this point, I, along with my field intern, Cedar, begin to investigate. Cedar, you want to take it from here? Uh, yes. Hello, Atticus. Good to see you. Every story has its genesis. And for Hans, Krug is his Eden. So that's where we go. So I, I hold the mic like this, or like... Just Cedar, no. Just, no. Bit, or like this. Don't touch the squishy part. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, here's the inn. Nice big windows, good view of the lake. We find some townsfolk at the town pub. One man claims he was at the Olympics, partying with the Kavalheim brothers. The party? Yeah, I don't remember that. The stupid corn, the nana fritters, now that I remember. The last time I saw Hans, he was trying to put popcorn in the pop organ. In this town, everyone has their theories. I heard that Hans had a blister from a tug of war, and it popped and it got infected, and he hated leeches, so he had some morphine instead, and he went on a long hike, and then he died of sun exposure and his blister infection also. I heard he ate too many dates, and then his spleen exploded. He was actually bumped on the head with a corky mallet. His nose bled all over the poetry. So heartbroken, he shimmed up the cathedral trail and drowned himself by the old swim rock. I heard Hans never actually made it to the games. The family had a look alike to take his place after Hans ran off with Dora Minkoff, the help, and took over a rinky dinky oyster farm in Nova Scotia. I don't think there ever was another twin. Yep, it was all an act so that the Kvelheims could win more medals than any other Olympic family. But people have seen Hans and Krishna together. How could one man pretend to be a pair hey, of- you tell me, Captain Hollywood, with your mirrors and studio boxes? I heard he was allergic to wool. Ah, oh, hey, he fell in a hole! 
one couple, they asked us to refer to them as Broccoli with a Y and Broccoli with an I, had a particularly rabid theory. I heard the ancient forest hag Hill Moore grabbed him by the ankles, hooked him like a fowl. Can you tell us which forest? The forest has many secrets. They're not for us to know. It was a great beast that ate him up, spit him out, put him in a stew, drank the stew. The more people we talked to, the more overwhelmed we were by information. And the more we distrusted memory. 1904 was a long time ago, after all. Blimey! I heard hands and Dora collie shackled over Mr. Bartholomew Richter's daddling with Dora's old man's flute and fly rink. The gal shimmed his giggle mug up to the cougar joint like it was batty duck soup, dolly wag, too much butter, brandy, greased an off and off and off mutton shutter, pod snapped his sauce box, smothered a pair of powder to whoop her up with a brandied Maffa King and chewified the half rat's gas pipes. She spun a good yarn, but I knew what she said was a bucket of lies. We get a call from Rhinebeck, New York. Hello, the name is Mary Pat Miller. She has a lead. You say you've seen him? Oh, I've seen him all right. It was 15 years ago. He was in a hot air balloon and had decided to land in Tivoli to buy a metric ton of cheddar cheese. That's a lot of cheese. Sure is. (laughs) Why in the world would Hans be buying cheese in Tivoli? Faye and I learn that Tivoli is one of the only places Canadians can go to get good cheese. The Nova Scotia oyster farm theory wasn't sounding so far-fetched. We decide to follow the hot air balloon lead. Knowing hot air ballooning accounts for 3% of the province's yearly sales, we grab our knit scarves and head to Nova Scotia. Shh. some downright disgusting dishes. <laughs> yeah, Rufus. <laughs> That's what I thought. Get your tutor down to Rufus Rib and Roadhouse Rub. We got ribs. We got corn. Can you dig it? We got slaw. We got brisket. We got tenderloin. We got sirloin. Sirloin. We got nails coming out of our wee walls. Yippee ki on the way. The property, Rufus. I'm glad you asked, Cletus. Find us two slap past Patsy's pet port on Jackson Junction across from the fancy McDonald's. And Skeeter's abandoned my job. These aren't the droids you're looking for. So pack up that stallion and set course for Rufus Rib and Roadhouse Rub. That's Rufus Rib and Roadhouse Rub. Really? I was literally sh- Rufus Rib and Roadhouse Rub does not take any responsibility for spleen ruptures, liver contusions, or boot bursts caused by the carnal delight that comes from this extreme barbecue experience. Please consume at your own discretion. So, you made it to Nova Scotia. Brr, that chill probably made you crave some sharp cheddar. <laughs> Cold off the ferry, we see a man on the far end of the dock hitching two lobster traps up to a Subaru. LeBlanc, a barnacles-nosed local. Um, uh, do you know any Scandinavians around here? Uh, maybe practicing hot air ballooning? Scandinavians? Ah, ah, hi. They're more of a blim people, no? You know, he's right. So... Canada was a barnacle bust. You barnacle bet, Atticus. At this point, I'd given up on figuring out what happened to Hans on that fateful night, let alone finding him. Disgruntled, I returned to my three-level brownstone in Brooklyn, New York, to spend some time with my children, who I hadn't seen in seven months. How were they? Oh, they were holding up fine without me. One night, I was helping my 12-year-old crossbeam with his history project. He was researching a famous figure and chose Harry Houdini. Now, Faye, don't get me wrong. I love hearing about cross beams inquiring young mind. But how is this related to Hans? I'm getting there. So, Crossbeam and I are looking at pictures of Harry Houdini on the internet when I stumble across something I did not expect to see. What was it? A picture of Harry Houdini 
standing between the two halves of a person for his famous saw in half then put back together trick. The image was taken the night before the big race at the 1904 Olympic Games. And instantly, I recognized both halves of the person. Those calves could only belong to one man. I kissed Crossbeam goodbye and hopped on the first plane to St. Louis. I was going to find that theater. And did you find it? Oh, I found it. Did I find it? I did. I found it. Yeah. I am here at the theater uh, where Harry Houdini performed that fateful night oh so many years ago. I have an appointment with their on-site historian. Okay, let's go. Thanks for meeting with me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? Of course, we have many records on that man. I think I have a few newspaper clippings here that can help. Oh yes, look, from 1904. Unlike anything the Illusionist Alliance has ever seen. The man who was sawed in half while his calves were so large that they had to double the leg hole size. <gasps> I know, Atticus, I know. You could probably learn more at the local magic shop. There's a magician's meeting of the minds once a week. I think it's tonight. I arrived at the magic shop. Inside, a few older folks milled around, drinking coffee out of paper cups and pulling coins out of each other's ears. I saw an old, old man sitting in a wheelchair. I knew it was him. After all this time, it had to be Hans. Sir, are you Hans Klaheim? Oh, no. That's my papa you're looking for. I am Hans Jr., I now run this here illusion establishment. Can you tell me a little bit about it? It's been in my family for almost a century now. Papa loves all things magic. Here is a picture of our family on our trip to the Bermuda Triangle. And here, of course, is Papa running as a Latin boy and crew. The calves are sort of a family staple by now. <laughs> Back this way. Come with me. Come with me. He ushered me back through a false bookshelf into a little room with wood paneled walls. That's when I saw him. The real Hans. He's there, lying on a medical bed with machines beeping around him. He's small, about 4'10 now, but that's to be expected given that he's 135 years old. His calves are so rock hard, like a cow's udders ripe for milking. He opens his eyes. Hans Jr., who is this beautiful American lady? Papa, an indie audio journalist is here to see you. Mr. Kvalheim, it's an honor to finally meet you. You must know that you're a legend. My child, don't flatter me. Here. Pick a card. He then performed a very elaborate 15-minute card trick for me. I must say, I was impressed. So, Hans, when did you discover your magical talents? Well, mine girl, I've always been taken by the works of great illusionists. Abracadabsters, we used to call them in my hometown, Krug. As to baby, I watched my Uncle Klaus Sr. play with a deck of cards. I always wished to learn the ways of the magician. But one day, Uncle Klaus ran into some trouble. You are now watching the amazing Uncle Dishmanko. Look close, baby Hans. I'm going to do a little trick for you. Would you please pass me the... Oh! Oh, no! My hands have been cut off while doing this slack hand trick. I will never be able to walk again. After that, magic was forbidden in our family by my grieving mother. So, you turned to running? Not by choice. Mother was very devastated, and the only thing that brought her joy was the town's annual milkmaid parade. Home 
Jones. Yeah. Christian. Uh huh. Anderson. Yeah. Klaus. Yeah. This winter has been particularly bad, and our horses are too weak to pull my carriage. What did she do? There was only one option. My brothers and I had to pull her ourselves. Good lord. It was the 19th century, mine girl. <laughs> Despite my young age of five, this became my life. And after many years of pulling mother's carriage all across town and back, Christian and I had become strong and fast. If we were too slow, mother would throw at us train bear, our local specialty. How do you say in English? Ride cranberries. Krug has oodles and doodles of them in the snowy times. You would think dried cranberries not that hard. But no, when thrown with the force of a scorned woman, they hurt like burnt baklava. Was Christiane as committed to running? And what of your magic? Mine twin was always very dedicated. But at night I would stay up late, under the blanket with a candle, learning card tricks. Once our town got the radio station, I learned of the great Harry Houdini. And he became my hero. How did you end up in the St. Louis Games? It was not my heart's dream. But it was my born talent to run. And my mother demanded it. We were to be her pretty petunias, the best at the flower fair. It wasn't until I was balls deep in the Olympic village that I found a way out. How's about those synchronized swimmers? If you are jonesing for some more entertainment, how would you like to see Lucy the Leperous Leaper, or those three brothers Jonas, or best of all, the great Houdini? Hey! Beautiful Scandy, but the calves. You like magic? Tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Get yourself there, you gorgeous Viking. And that's when the story really starts. I'm on the edge of my seat. When I went to the show, I saw him, went up close like this, nose to nose almost. I told him, weeping. I don't want to alternate stepping on my right foot and my left foot in a fast, repetitive motion for the rest of my life. No more swinging arms like giant chicken wings, blood from my chafed nipples trickling down to my big, big peeper. You got to meet your hero. Oh, darling, it was wunderbar. He then said to me, Tonight will be my first attempt at the saw in half put back together a losel. Be my volunteer. <laughs> if you can pull this off, maybe you and those calves can stick around. <laughs> Stepping onto the stage that night, I realized, why run when you can levitate into the realm of magical glory? But what about your running career and your brother? And how are you in one piece? Oh, <laughs> Velcro, my girl. And as for my brother, he was better off without me. If it weren't for my brother's disappearance, I never would have gone to win the 1908 marathon and meet that foxy Hungarian archer. I think that silly little cranberry twin of mine every day. Oh, after many years of touring and illusions, Harry passed away in, what was it? 1926? It hit me harder than the Great Depression. Or that time when Mormor's cow, Mooseal Ball, stopped producing milk. I lost myself. I forgot why I left the track for some stud illusionist. I returned to the old theater in St. Louis. When I saw that this shop was for rent, I took it as a sign. And I just love those fried little green tomatoes they make here. So, that's the story. After that part of the interview, he started mumbling the lyrics to his mother's milking song. Wow, that is just incredible. I never would have guessed that this would be the ending to the story, and that Hans would be alive? I was surprised too, but I did hear that he passed away five minutes after I left. 
Well, that's about all the time we have for today. We hope you enjoyed this wildly thrilling Olympic episode of The Inkwell. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to our sponsors, Hypnos and Rufus Ribbon Roadhouse. Get ready for next week's episode, where we'll be asking the question, did Amelia Earhart really invent anal beads? (laughs) You found me. You're listening to The Inkwell.